super mega live. <laughs> yes. That's a term you may use. Uh, Thank you. All right. Welcome to the stream, everybody. Uh, that's a new opening. I've been practicing in front of the mirror. <laughs> <laughs> With us today, we have Per Olson, as always. Yes. My hello. trusty, my trusty BFF. Yes. Say hi again. Hello, hello to the stream. <laughs> and also Laura Kankala. That's how you pronounce it in Finnish. And in English, we're gonna say Lo Laura Kankala. <laughs> yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, and Laura is the security lead at Robocorp Incorporated. I think it's somehow related to Evil Corp, which was in the uh, Mr. Robot uh, series. Yeah, and, almost. <laughs> and you're also the host of 150 different podcasts. <laughs> uh, uh, you're a hacker slash actor on a TV show in Finland called Team Whack. <laughs> You're in the Community Cyber Defense Force, Kybervepeko, pronounced in Finnish. And what else? You're a security researcher, white hat hacker, keynote speaker. She will actually be one of the speakers at our conference. Uh, and she is... Uh, are you? Uh, yeah, well, I'm in the board of members, but I'm actively, disactively organizing as well. Right now, there is not much to organize. We are in between seasons, but but yeah, I'm in the board of members at least. So I'm I'm sitting there and trying to act smart. So is there something? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's on my LinkedIn. <laughs> so oh, okay. did Joachim miss any of the roles or things that you are active in? Um, I I don't think so. I don't think so. I think that covers pretty much everything. And and uh, yeah, right now I have only one podcast ongoing, but but yeah, it's true. I've had a couple of podcasts in the past, for example, a couple of English uh, podcasts as well, such as we need to talk about InfoSec, which is on a pause for at least for now. Let's see if I'll continue it in the future. And then for Detectify, where I used to work, uh, we did a, a couple of episodes of a podcast called Undetected. So that's also in, in English. But right now I'm doing a podcast in, in the scriptic language of Finnish as well. But yeah, podcasting has become a hobby of mine. An encrypted podcast in Finnish. <laughs> yes. yes. Uh, so last time on our stream, we had Benjamin and he obviously is also a member of Team Whack on the TV show. So now that you're uh, both celebrities, could you tell us how you got started with creating a TV show? Which is, I mean, for normal people like me, I have no idea. Like, how do I suddenly start a TV show? What happened? <laughs> yeah, uh, I have to say there was a specific learning curve for us as well. It wasn't really that easy as we assumed at first. So um yeah i think like we we all ended up in that show for uh through different uh, channels and i for example i ended up on the show through my friend uh who we did this short basically video clips or like auditions you could say that were showcased to test audience and the, 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 then the um, test audience basically picked who was the i don't know <laughs> most interesting or intriguing or different or something so so i got picked to be one of the um main actors as as joachim put it in that documentary tv show so yeah then we started to basically uh lay out the possibilities that we could do the first session that we had we had actually quite a lot of people involved in the initial like when we were doing the pilot we had a lot of ideas coming in and some of them were not that doable and some of them were more doable uh, with the terms of budget and time and everything that we had so then at the end we narrowed down to just the three of us being in the central of that team whack tv series and then for the first season we had a couple of uh, hackers also helping us uh, behind the scenes so there was jarmo putton and putsi and 
and also Hey Kiva. So, so they were helping out with, for example, the car hacking thing uh, that we did, and also with some of the other hacking hacking things. And for that, uh, for people who have not seen Team Wax, so that's again in Finnish, unfortunately. Uh, a couple of those episodes have English subtitles in Ule Arena and in um, YouTube. But it's basically we did these. Uh, it's a mini documentary series, you could say that we we had episodes ranging from uh, five to ten minutes and. And, and we hacked into different things. We hacked into, as I said, car and into IoT devices, into YouTubers' life and into gaming streams and and into a company and so on, just to showcase basically what the, like how hacking looks in real life. So it's not that that you see in Hollywood movies necessarily that someone is sitting in a basement and just hitting on their keyboard and then something explosions happen and stuff like this. So it's much more. Um, I would say boring in a sense, and and naturally in that as well, they had cut out all of the time we spent debugging and writing the exploit code and stuff like this. So so it's in a very tight, compact packet, but it still uh, tries to showcase uh, showcase what it looks like to be basically a white hat hacker, and and what does it look like to basically do hacking. Yeah, a lot of people when they think about hacking, they think about Mission Impossible and Tom Cruise coming down from the ceiling. It's not really like that. Yeah, uh, yeah it's much but more I, boring. <laughs> I, I guess, um, actually, you kind of dodged my first question, to be honest. Sorry, what was the question? Yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> I, I kind of wanted to know how you got into doing that in the first place. Like, what happened? Mm. Did someone just go like, Laura? You'd be a great actor in a hacking TV <laughs> documentary series, or, or yeah. how did that happen? Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, I think I started that story, but then I got into the explaining what Team Wack is. So, <laughs> yeah. um, with my friend, we went to the auditions, and we we basically the director for the show. Uh, he oh took wait, a short wait, wait, wait! Video. Back up, back up. Yeah. Auditions. Yeah, is we had. That's show. how it started. Was yeah, there like perfect. someone posted that we're going to do a hacking TV show and here are <laughs> no. auditions or? It was more of a private audition. So, for example, my friend had heard about it from the director himself and as well as uh, like the director had contacted Ira and Benjamin and several others separately. So it wasn't ah, okay. a public uh, audition, uh, so to say, also because it needed some kind of a special expertise in that. So uh, unfortunately, not everyone could have auditioned for that as well uh, because it won the this was also something I, I believe that they thought of, like, should they hire actors and make it more dramatic in that sense, like make, make the documentary series more more a illustration and, and more more like that. And then just have uh, hackers or security professionals like me on the background and explain them what to do and, and you know, have someone with like <laughs> more acting experience and maybe better looks on there, but then have these like experts on the behind the scenes. But then then it ended up being like this. So so that we we ended up being the actors also in that as well as the professionals. So it ended up being a proper documentary in that sense. So, so yeah, when, um, uh, that's how basically I ended up in that. So, so through the audition phase and then, uh, we, we made first a pilot. So the pilot was a, uh, I believe it was three episodes or four episodes. Like the fourth one was a lot, tiny bit shorter, uh, but, uh, those were never made public. It was to, only to sell basically the concept to Ule. Uh, which is the Finnish national radio, but they have a TV channel. So, so we made those, and then Ule said that okay, yeah, let's let's do this. It sounds interesting. And then we made the first season, and it was really well received. People really seemed to like it, and and people really appreciated it to have this kind of look into uh, cybersecurity, like a really hands-on look. And I I think a lot of people understood then the actual impact of these things. So so the basically the target audience is not necessarily people like us but it's more like the people who don't have the cybersecurity presence in their everyday life that actually uh, can use that information to make more uh, secure or more aware choices online for example so, so yeah I, and then yeah sorry i have a follow-up question because you were mentioning that they were thinking of having actors to play you, for example. Mm -hmm. 
yeah. who who would be your choice of actor for yourself <laughs> i don't know angela jolie <laughs> oh nice yeah, yeah. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> no but I, i i'm not sure if that was actually on the board or if it was more of a running joke that we had on like during the breaks and stuff like that but it, it was like a fun fun like uh <laughs> like thought experiment to think of who would be the actual actor to for example play <laughs> my role or eros role or benjamin's role but but yeah i don't know let's uh, that 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 remains to be seen who, who would have well, been the best match maybe in the next like the hollywood version of the same thing <laughs> maybe we can have angelina jolie <laughs> yeah <laughs> maybe i'll need to dm her over twitter <laughs> <laughs> so was it only one season or is there any plan for for follow-ups Uh, yeah, we made two seasons of that. So the first season came out last year and the second season came out uh, this year in May. So uh, right now we don't have any plans for continuing this, uh, but or, uh, yeah. Or are you just not disclosing it? <laughs> My lips are sealed. <laughs> ah, so there is a chance. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but uh, I mean, uh, the uh, even the second season, it was uh, very well received and it had a lot of views and everything. Uh, so, so yeah, we'll see what happens in the future. Uh, so now when you don't uh, will do TV anymore, you still do like security research, public speaking, podcast and so on. Uh, what will you spend this extra time on? Like, do you have any <laughs> other things like are you going to write a book or something? <laughs> Um, I feel that I'm keeping quite busy with my day-to-day -day work and also with the podcast. That, that that takes a lot of time, for example, just editing one episode. Uh, oh, yeah, like, I know. It, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, like you probably have, have uh, experience on that as well. Um, then, yeah, I do some public speaking as well, but then uh, I'm also running this... Um, It's a non-profit charity organization right now. Uh, it goes under Disobey, but it's called Outreach, where we help at-risk groups with their internet privacy and security. And we do basically um, research, but not necessarily traditional security research in terms of trying to find vulnerabilities in, in specific technology, but trying to make uh, security research so that it could be beneficial for people who are in a position, let's say, in a domestic abuse position where in, in which uh, digital devices are used to uh, basically perform that abuse or they're part of that abuse. So, so we are trying to help out in, in those kind of things. Uh, we already released one basically guidance uh, paper. Uh, I think it was half a year ago, uh, approximately. It's in disobeyoutreach.com. If I, uh, sorry, .com. Uh, you can read it from there. And then we are right now continuing with the research and basically looking into stalkerware more uh, in more detail and, and publishing something about that soon uh, in the upcoming months as well. So yeah, I'll, I'll try to keep myself like st stay useful for, for uh, in terms of security. And, and I feel that for example, Uh, bringing this knowledge out of this immediate security domain, I feel personally that that is very uh, fulfilling for me, and I I feel that that is where where I can help a lot of people and and shed some light into the mysteries of security. Uh, yes, I got the impression that many of your initiatives uh, are targeted for like uh, the general public, and uh, you also do like a lot of awareness campaigns and things like that. Uh, Why do you think it's so important to to spread this uh, security awareness knowledge to the to the general public? I feel that uh, well, for one, security and privacy, and and I, I'm, when I'm talking about security uh, in general public, that also in a lot of cases encompasses uh, privacy to some extent. I feel that it's something that well, it's very uh, fruitful and very like this this bubble of ours where we talk about security. It's very there's a lot of interesting things going on and a lot of things that 
are just interesting technically and, and for example, in hacking perspective, but they're not necessarily interesting for the general public. And there is so, so much information in this bubble that I just want to kind of like break it a little bit so it goes out mm -hmm. there as well. But uh, I also understand that a lot of these things that we talk about uh, are not necessarily interesting for, let's say, for my mother or, by the way, hi, mother, if you're, <laughs> mom, if you're on the, listening to this right now, but uh, basically just to make security available because a lot of the times our own level of security is really dependent on how we act online. So let's say there is phishing campaigns, there's a lot of scams online. So just being aware of the risks when you're online and, and what, what can happen if you uh, basically, let's say, fall for a phishing campaign. So that's not only necessarily you that is affected. It could be your organization, your community, uh, wh whichever group you're part of that, that can be affected. So I feel that there's a lot of things that we cannot provide a technical means uh, to fix in terms of security. We can try to improve security by installing antivirus and, and having hox hunt or different kinds of tools for phishing awareness, but there's still so much that we cannot cover with technical means because computers are just that, that they, they do something very good. Like they, they do what you instruct them to do very well and, and very efficiently, but that's basically it. And then, uh, like these, all these, like good hacks, they, they go through these uh, technical means of detecting them because they, they perform just like any other software or like non-malicious software, or then they send, like they start out with just emails or something that should be expected to work and, and that they can use to leverage uh, in these attacks. So, so I feel that there's a lot of things that uh, still needs to be discussed with the public and, and some things that are not necessarily obvious to everyone uh, as compared to like how obvious it can be to us. Are there any any specific uh, groups that you would like to, to reach out more to? Uh, I know last time we talked with Benjamin about uh, how important it is to reach out to uh, kids at a younger age so they don't end up on the wrong side of hacking and also to uh, engage with the community instead and uh, uh, well, basically teach the teachers, because uh, today there is a, a lack of knowledge uh, in IT security, uh, especially when it comes to uh, the schools and the teachers. Do you agree on that? And um, how do you think we should reach this group uh, most efficiently? I know you're also involved with uh, women in IT or tech, and that is also another group that uh, uh, we need to reach out more to. Mm. Um, that's an excellent question. And I think there's a lot of groups that could use security in term, like, uh, as I said, for example, in these domestic abuse cases and then children, and then anyone who is basically, I would say in this position that they are, um, highly impressionable and also very vulnerable in that sense to, to these kinds of attacks. Let's say that you are in a um in an abusive relationship so these for example using stalkerware to uh, and stalkerware is an typically it's an application or some kind of device that you install on someone's computer or uh to their devices overall and then you monitor their activities online and so on so these are all basically exploiting these people who are already in compromising positions right so they are already very vulnerable to these kinds of attacks you could say so reaching out to these people and for once like not only to help them like how to cope with this but also like personally i feel that we need to denormalize this kind of mindset that we are having that that we don't necessarily need privacy. For example, that we share credentials or passwords to, with our friends or with our partners to our social media, to our emails and so on. Because a lot of these things, they when everything is going fine and dandy and and, and, and we love each other and, and or we are the best friends, then there's nothing to worry about that. But then once things turn sour, these things are so easy to turn against you. So it's kind of like, the mindset that these things in my like this digital space that I have around myself, this is for me only, and this should remain in my own control. And uh, I don't know, somehow, like, I feel that there is a shift in this 
I think it's overall with social media and, and these platforms that are denormalizing privacy in a sense that also bring this idea of that it's okay, for example, to share your, um, like I said, like credentials to social media accounts or email and, and so on. So it's kind of becoming, I feel, a norm that we don't have privacy instead of we have privacy. Yeah, I completely agree. I've... I hopefully will not see the, the end of uh, privacy in our lifetime. But uh, yeah. well, looking at the progress of the recent years, it looks like we might be. And yeah. la last time I saw you, we talked about this and uh, you mentioned that you've been involved in a few cases. Is there any case that you could talk a little bit about sort of anonymously without mentioning names or anything like that? Um, these cases are typically quite sensitive and I would say that they're also quite dark in a sense that it's, um, I don't know if I have any example that I'm comfortable bringing here right now, but I, what I can say is that, uh, these, um, these stalking cases, for example, using stalker or different types of means of stalking someone, they're not only exclusive to, um, in, in relationships, they can happen also in friendships or in these kind of other, uh, social, uh, structures as well. But what I can say is that uh, they are typically part of a bigger issue. So there's already bigger, like either physical uh, threat of physical violence or a threat of uh, mental violence. So so it's a part of, it's a culmination of these things and it's a, just a way of executing these kind of uh, behaviors. But uh, for the victims of these, these kind of cases, what I see systematically, it's not just that they're like oh okay my facebook account someone is using it like i don't care but it's very mentally scarring and it's so mentally scarring that they they can have uh for the rest of their lives potentially just uh these this mistrust in people and mistrust in technology and then also there's a lot of like in terms of mistrust in technology uh, for when it comes to spouses and, and friends and so on, there's a lot of misconceptions about hacking, for example, and, and what is possible to hack. So if you have, let's say, a friend or a spouse who is more tech savvy, so you can have this uh, mistrust that they basically they are able to hack me no matter what. So, so they are able to get into my Facebook account or they're able to basically follow me through or follow me through my devices or uh, tack, like see where I'm going and everything because they're such a good hacker because they're so tech savvy. While in most cases, uh, it may not be true. So this could be also part of the other person basically being kind of like, I'm so tech savvy, so you should be afraid of me kind of thing. But it's such a complex issue. And uh, again, this this thing is not solved by technical means, but I'm hoping that we can, for example, provide guidance into how to deal with these things and also shed some light into what hacking actually is and, and how it operates. So that, for example, in a lot of cases, instead of your spouse being a super great hacker, they potentially can just guess your password, right? So you have an easily guessable password to your social media account. And that is, I would say, much, much more common than that that your uh, your uh, spouse would, I don't know, be an epic hacker. Yeah, and more likely that they uh, would, would uh, take your phone and, and, and fingerprint and unlock your phone than actually finding a zero day or something like that. Uh, yeah, definitely, yeah. And one of the things you had in the Team Wax series is kind of related to this, I think. Uh, when you hacked the YouTuber, basically, I think also a lot of YouTubers and uh, sort of people who are very present on social media like YouTubers streamers, etc., uh, might not necessarily always understand what they're sharing. You know, I remember you took, uh, she, the YouTuber took a picture of herself and in the background, you could basically triangulate from what was seen in the background. You could triangulate, triangulate her position and where she was living and all that stuff. And for a lot of these, uh, celebrities, etc., it can be it could be good for them to understand the risks with uh, related to this, especially if, you know, because they, let's say they have a lot of followers and in that mm -hmm. group of followers, there's probably all kinds of crazy 
people unfortunately mm -hmm. so it's, yeah definitely. it's probably also like one of your groups that uh I but guess then again, you... of course, the, the, the platforms like like uh, Twitch, YouTube, uh, Facebook, and all of these, they should also be doing more, at least in my opinion. So they, 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 could, they could do more and uh, they don't. Yeah, it's a, I mean, like I always tell people not to take pictures from there, like so that the whatever is outside their window is visible, for example, or from the immediate surroundings of their home or, for example, from their front door, because it for anyone who is dedicated enough uh, by any kind of picture, it's it's like possible to determine when where one like where this person is living either completely like the direct uh, address or at least the proximity or the uh, like the around like the area where they're living and there's so many like even in this case like uh, the spe specific architecture on the background of our rooms and everything like there's a lot of uh, examples around this for example there was this uh, I think it was South Korean uh, pop star or uh, k-pop star and she took a picture and in the reflection yeah. of her eyes or was it in her eye eyeglasses was a like her window and then some fanatic stalker found her address through that and there's for example uh interpol has the initiative i can't remember what it's called but if if you google interpol there is the website where they share pictures that are related to uh abuse of children for example and they crowdsource uh the help of finding the where that place is located so with enough people and enough knowledge of for example uh, what kind of climate in specific place there is and with just google maps it's it's possible to determine anyone's location yeah. I, I think it's interpol who has this uh, like uh, event once a year and uh, like organize maybe you're aware of the organization uh, belling cats um, mm -hmm. open source yeah. research group they, they are often involved in in the cases i think they solved like a handful of missing children cases last uh, last year and that was only by looking at old pictures and see what was behind it and doing searches on social media and so on yeah yeah and i think that's that's awesome that interpol for example is is taking advantage of the crowdsource in yeah, intelligence yeah. online because i think there's a lot of people who are very good at these things and also just reaching out globally to people because some people may just recognize a place when they see the picture because oh this is where i live this is like right next door to me but then, of course, you always have, uh, you know, you know, social media and they always have these dark patterns, you know, like sharing as quick as possible. I always recommend people that are out traveling and things like that. To, oh, I'm in Spain and, and take the picture right now and share it right now. I say, take the picture, but share it when you are back home instead. Yeah. You, you don't have to share it at this moment because, uh, you know, it's so easy today to just... Uh, just uh, search on Twitter or other social media for, uh, let's say, a ticket. Or um, I actually found this pretty pretty cool Twitter account a few days ago. It's at uh, need a debit card, and uh, and <laughs> it's basically people taking pictures of their custom designs. You know, you can get the custom design on your debit mm -hmm. card, and people are posting it online. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, and uh, there's a guy that basically just. Um, uh, search for for the for the tag debit card and then he uploads the, oh the no yeah that's that's always i uh, like please but, but, but for, for us it, it it's well it we can always we, we are not perfect beings we always make mistakes also mm. but for us it's probably more obvious that that is a bad thing uh, so, so that's why I think it's so important that we share this um awareness basically the why it is bad and 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 uh, what you can do about it instead yeah uh, but then again uh, our our uh, competitors or the one we are fighting are the big social media platforms so we are kind of in the losing losing uh, race but a uh, losing battle yeah that's true yeah and it's well i think well this is just me but i i think uh the like sharing a picture of your credit card or debit card it should go into the domain that okay by now everyone should kind of start to realize that this should not should not be done but then there's less obvious things for example sharing a picture of your 
a key to your house, for example, that has the uh, teeth basically showing or then uh, posting a picture of your badge to your work or something like that. So those are not necessarily that obvious why that could be a problem. So, for example, posting a badge of your workplace, it makes it so easy for uh, an attacker who would want to uh, tailgate into the building or do like a go physically into the building just to replicate the uh, how the badge looks so so it would make the, their life a lot easier and then also the keys that if you can see the teeth or how it's made then you could potentially clone that but it's it's um it's also uh, hard in terms of like these things like going back to the awareness and everything because these are not something that because they are not always immediately obvious. Like we see these credit cards, for example, posted yeah. online. So and, there's and of course, if, if I would buy a new house, of course, mm -hmm. I want to share it on social media. And mm -hmm. what will I post? Well, probably the keys on the table or something. Yeah, there's so many, like if, if for example, you go on Twitter, uh, sorry, on Instagram and look for hashtag or, uh, or just search for new home or new house or yeah, something, yeah. you can see so many uh, keys posted there. But th that's the problem because this is like knowledge that you don't necessarily possess unless you look at the things the malicious way. So I think like, for example, us, when we look at these things, we immediately think, okay, I could misuse this information. Okay, this information, this is handy for, for someone who wants to actually do something evil. So so it's such a, it's, it's a different mindset. And I think it go, goes down to us as people humans and us people we don't want to uh, see people as potentially evil we want to think the best of other people right so that's a good thing but then there are so many people online all the time just scraping for this kind of information and they don't have good deeds in mind so that's the basically issue and that's where we need the awareness part but then again we don't want to uh, scare people yeah. Uh, we still only want to present the, the, the truth and not scare them or but, to lie to them. And what I also think is that, for example, sharing your debit card, that's something that these platforms could easily solve, right? They could have machine learning algorithms to oh, recognize yeah. cards and just remove them because it's not safe to do that. Yeah. But for other more or, you know, and for some people, common sense will tell you that you shouldn't share it. But for other things that we talked about earlier, like, for example, the picture of you at your at the window of your apartment, that's something that I think most people will not realize that that could actually like help locate you. So I don't know. It's kind of like a, a thin line, like how far should we go? Because I don't feel like we should go all the way to kind of what they have in the US, for example, on the ironing board, they're, they're telling, or the ironing thing, they're telling you not to iron yourself because it's hot, you might burn yourself. <laughs> so I think we need to consider how far we should go with yeah. the advice we give. Yeah, that's true because we can't always like protect people from their, themselves as well. And then there's just mistakes that happen. And for some people, maybe in their risk model or threat model that they have made internally, they don't see, for example, revealing their home address as potentially dangerous. Maybe they think that it's fine. I, I haven't had any issues with my uh, neighbors or with my, if they're a public person, then I have, have had no issues with my fans or anything. So I'm okay with sharing this information. And again, that's something that they can decide on their own. But if that's something that they don't want to do, then it's, it's really uh, critical to look at the pictures they post and everything, uh, like of their daily lives that could that be revealing of their position in the world. How many people do you think have a threat model of themselves? Because you said, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I I don't think that they they think of it as the with the words like I'm now threat modeling my life, but potentially they're <laughs> like, hmm, do I feel a tiny bit uh, uneasy uneasy if if someone comes to knocking on my door? So maybe that's the <laughs> more common way of thinking about threat modeling. And of course, uh, the, the, advi the advices that we give, you still don't have to go full crazy tinfoil like, like, like we do. Mm. If the general public would only improve slightly, that would still be a huge improvement. Let's say like uh, uh, more people would, would activate 2FA, for example, or if you would uh, 
think one extra time before you you uh, share one picture on Instagram, but the rest of them you you still share. That is still an improvement than, when, than when what we have today. Yeah, definitely. So, so let's not forget the the, the small uh, improvements that can also do. Yeah, definitely. And I I I plus one that definitely. And it's also about the basically thinking about the if we now go to to our like when we think about security so we do a lot of threat modeling so no kind of security solution will provide us with zero percentage or zero percentage risk so everything comes with a risk we just try to minimize the risk and make the risk so that it could happen like it would take a lot of time for example the attacker to exploit something so uh, if you think about just real life and us as humans so um, even if we take good care of not posting stuff on Instagram or not doing this and that, then there's always the possibility that someone just goes to a place they know we visit often, let's say at work, and they just follow us home, for example. So again, that mitigation is not foolproof again. So there's no way of bringing this zero risk ever into our lives, whether it's a technical solution or it's our own security. And that's, I think, probably the um, the most <laughs> interesting part of security as well. Yeah, what is accepted risk and what do you accept as your risk? What's okay? I mean, if we think about, uh, let's say, JFK, for example, he probably had a pretty good security, but still someone you know, took his life. So if someone really wants to do something bad, then they will probably find a way if they apply themselves long enough, which which is unfortunate, of course, but that's mm. the way it is. Yep. So with that in mind, I think one of the cool things that maybe not so many people know about you is that you're technically pretty savvy. Uh, even more savvy so than just talking about uh, stalkers. <laughs> uh, I remember that you, in one of the episodes on TeamWack, you wrote an exploit, for example. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, well, in the first season and in the second season, I wrote a couple of things. And yeah. in the second season, I got some help from external sources for some things. But yeah, I do t like... Uh, for example, when uh, doing something custom, for example, that we did for Team Wack, so you do need to do a lot of your own writing as well, also because it needs to look a certain way, right? And and it needs to be delivered in a certain manner and so on. So so yeah, I, I did some, some ad hoc <laughs> exploit development there. <laughs> yeah, and that's kind of something I just wanted to bring up because uh, you are actually like a super pro hacker, so... I just wanted to bring that up so that people know that she's serious business, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And and uh, like I, I believe that there is a lot to be learned and, and a lot to be learned from the overall like, community. For example, in Team Wax Season 2, I have to say or give credit to one of my friends who helped me. Uh, I think his name was also in, in the ending credits, but Henry, for helping with me with the macro exploit with the uh for Lahi Tapiola, one of the episodes in or local Tapiola. Uh so so I, I you like I owe my life to him, but <laughs> but then a lot of the times it just yeah. It's something like it's kind of like uh, as with any development that you you look stuff online and then you copy paste stuff and then you like write code around it. So it's it's not necessarily as as fancy <laughs> as that but like uh but but yeah I, I try my best and i try my best to learn new stuff all the time and you kind of brought up uh, a cool thing i think uh without maybe even ro realizing it but the hacker security hacker slash security community in finland is pretty helpful so whenever you need help if you're new to the game etc you can always hop on to citysec.disobey.fi uh, which is like a chat platform. Welcome to anyone. Ask questions, uh, teach others, whatever you want to do. So yeah. the community is very helpful with regards to that. And nobody is an expert at anything. There's so much in this security space that we can learn and do. So don't expect to be the best and always keep on learning. 
right? yeah de de definitely and and with security and it overall it's such a it's such a big field there is so many things to do so not one person can basically do everything or if they want to they will be average at best and and i feel that for example i'm in a position that i've had had the chance to learn a lot of things like the uh, basics of a lot of things and and i feel very lucky to have had the opportunity and for example uh in team WAC, so there was a lot of things that i didn't know before starting that so you just learn as you as you do these things right so it's it's always the things that you learn they can come from so many different places it doesn't need to be just a tv show it can just be attending a local conference or it can be just listening to a youtube video and just talking to your friends that you just grasp new ideas and, and new ways of working so, so, so how do you stay up to date with security is there like um any specific persons uh, that you look up to or follow if you have like any, any mentors inspirations um well I'll, i read a lot and uh well i read a lot of news but i also try to read a lot of just things that pop up for example in twitter so i follow a lot of people there i don't have anyone in specific because i think there's so many like people that are worth following uh and and that provide uh, interesting research and just also journalists who who write about interesting things that they have found out for example uh like through whistleblowers or through other means from companies and then um well also because of the podcast that i have with a couple of my friends uh, we we go through basically uh, what's topical right now. So that also forces me to basically do my research on on the what's hot right now. And and so I, I think that that helps me to stay updated for the basically at least for the threats out there and what's happening and and then just overall talking with friends in this cybersecurity scene in Finland and and elsewhere as well and just chatting with them and asking what's up and what's going on and and finding out what's relevant for them and I feel that that's really eye opening sometimes. I think your mom is in the chat. And is she's she? saying <laughs> yeah well, someone's mom, Mimili mom, she is uh, saying that she is the most hardworking person I know, always doing and studying something. Does that sound your, like your mom? <laughs> that's Yeah, that's probably my mom. Thank you, mom. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe send her a heart or something. <laughs> there we go. We got we to gotta give credit to your mom as well, because... You know, she gave birth to you and here we are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's that's fortunate that I am here. And thank, thank you for raising me to be the person I am today. Oh, that's a great question, by the way. How did your mom impact you into getting into computers and security? Let's talk about uh, that. <laughs> yeah, let's talk about that. That's an interesting question. Um. Okay, I'll go back uh, to my past. So um, I think we got the first computer uh, in the 90s. So it was like 95, 96, something around that time. And um, I have this picture. I, I typically show it during my talks because I think it kind of showcases my past quite well. So it's a picture of me sitting uh, in front of my computer and then my little sister pulling on the chair and asking for her <laughs> turn on the computer. <laughs> and and I used to like back in that day we we didn't have internet connection but I was really into just playing games and and I I was so into that I would get epileptic seizures and my oh, mother my would God. have to wrestle my wrestle me from the computer <laughs> and uh, I used to play I don't know if you played Zach Jazz Rabbit ever oh yeah. yes yes I yeah that. <laughs> that was I my the cheat codes yeah. <laughs> That was my, I, I used to love that game as a kid. And, and I actually, I tried to play it a, like a, a year or so ago. Uh, you can play it online these days. And I was like, this, this doesn't look the way I remember it looked like. I remember it being much more colorful and somehow like just this amazing more, experience. More vivid, more vivid and you know, like more realistic than it was, I guess. 
Yeah, yeah. It's it's funny how I, I think when the graphics weren't that great, then you just in your head you basically filled the gaps for some things. But yeah, I was um, like we had the computer, and then then we uh, when I went to the uh, went went to school and everything. Then I was really into gaming, and and I, we got PlayStation and so on. Like when I was in the first grade, and I was actually very shy when I was a kid, so I didn't really have a lot of friends. And this, like for example, during the elementary uh, school, the first year, I was very heavily bullied, or well, not bullied, but I was uh, very. Uh, like outcasted from the overall like the school environment and uh fortunately we moved to a different place quite early on so uh, towards the end of my first grade we moved to uh different uh like different areas so i changed schools at that point and i got a lot of friends but even then i was very very shy and i had like a like a two or three people i spoke to in the in the class i was so shy but I think for me, computers and especially like playing at that time was like this thing that helped me to express myself and, and helped me to get also friends. And, and once we, for example, had internet connection, I started to be really into making websites and being part of specific internet communities. Also, because I felt that those were places where I could uh, well, anonymously, but be myself and express myself. So uh, the early 2000s or so, I started to make websites. That at first, I just made them this, like in a dra drag and drop way in GeoCities. But then uh, I found out that that wasn't very scalable. And for example, if you had different resolutions, the the websites looked all all not nice. So so I had to teach myself how to uh, code websites. So I started to do that, and and. Um, yeah, back then there was no social media in that sense that it is today. Like I think some first iterations of Facebook was there and then yeah, MySpace. Like MySpace yeah. <laughs> yeah, MySpace. But I, I wasn't really like I didn't get that at the time because also there people shared their pictures quite openly. And, and for me, like I remember in Finland, we had this uh, website called IRC Gallery or IRC Galleria, where yeah. it was this first basically proper social media, I, I feel, in Finland. It was initially a place uh, if you were on IRC and it was not convenient to share pictures there. So you would share them through IRC Gallery, gallery basically. But then at some point it tra transformed into this kind of like Facebook, Instagram-ish place where people would share pictures of themselves and names and, and so on. And then uh, at some point I got along to that when all of my friends were there. And then I was like, okay, all of a sudden it's okay to share your pictures online and your name. And apparently all of this, like suddenly the internet that I grew up in and knew, it had transformed into the space that privacy was like, you you didn't need to be anonymous anymore and for some reason like because the early 2000 uh i was told constantly not to share my full name and my never put my picture online and all of these things then like by 2010 all of this had changed with facebook so so everyone was there and at some point i remember in facebook people would explicitly state their home address as well and I was very, very shocked, like, how, how can this happen? And even for IRC Gallery, I tried to keep this sense of privacy. I remember I didn't share, for example, my last name. And, and as much as I could, I tried to keep this, like, I don't know, be somewhat uh, anonymous there, but it wasn't really possible. And then I ended up also sharing my own pictures there because of, I don't know, peer pressure or something. But, but yeah, it's it's interesting how it shifted. So uh, like quite suddenly this world that like the internet, like everyone had their own websites or they were on IRC, uh, sorry, IRC, not IRC gallery, but an IRC behind a nickname or a alias, then suddenly it was all gone. And now it's weird if you're not sharing your life online. And for example, well, I, I am sharing my life uh, quite a bit online also because I feel that it's like my my this this like with it being on TV shows and everything, it's already basically gone. But but it's something that I it was it took some time to get used to, definitely, at least for me. That is actually a really kind of interesting point that I, I haven't considered earlier 
but yeah back in the day it was like publicly uh, sort of known that you should not share your information online like you shouldn't do it and then no, suddenly it, it was, it was like, like okay it, it was same like uh, uh, don't talk to strangers on the streets and don't jump into the cars with, with strangers like uh, today people are basically doing that but online instead they're sharing so much information they're talking to strangers on social media in games in in chats and so on mm -hmm. Yeah, and we are booking rooms from people uh, we don't know and taking rides mm -hmm. from random people. And, and there is a lot of like, I think, like in a sense, like this having more trust in our lives, for example, with these like Airbnb and Uber and then sharing information to some extent, that's great and that's nice. But then it's also, well, then like, like a social media and a broader topic, then it's just it's also much more unfair, I would say. For example, the content you see and the basically the machine learning algorithms that are pitted against you to show you what they think that you want to see. And, and then it also, for example, going back to the early 2000s and remembering the good old days of the internet. So there was no, for example, the search engines were really bad at the time, if you remember. You Alta really Vista. If you wanted Yes. Yeah, all the vista. You wanted. To, I remember actually one time. This was in elementary school during our computer class, and our teacher. Uh, we had a quite a small school. The teacher also happened to be the principal of the school, but but he was really convinced that everyone should have very uh, like a lot of education in computers, which was actually really nice. But I remember mm -hmm. how, when he um, had this class for us, and he wanted to show how to use Google. <clears throat> and how to use Google image search and how to use the text-based search and stuff like this. And at that point, like no matter what you search, you will always see something R-rated there in there. So something not suitable for elementary school students. <laughs> but he, I could like, I remember he was sitting there and he was thinking so hard, what would be a word that wouldn't, <laughs> so, like if I search for it, it wouldn't show anything explicit. So he sh searched for something like, I think it was like grain or wheat, wheat or something like that. So, so something that sounds very innocent, but once he typed that in, I went to the image search immediately, like so many explicit pictures just like <laughs> spammed in there in our faces. And we as kids, we were like, oh, wow, OK, this is interesting. <laughs> like yeah. naturally at that point, like I was very familiar with Google and these things. So so I already knew what was coming, <laughs> basically. <laughs> but but for a lot of the other kids, it was quite a shock at the time and also a running joke. But but that just goes to show how hard it was to actually find anything online and and for like searching anything you would need to do basically link crawling and there would be websites that would be just links to different places so i think it's kind of like how well not not quite but almost how if you go on tour and on onion websites how, yeah. how it is there basically these days and and but then like throughout the like 2000s, the like search engines, like the optimization of those, especially Google, uh, like increased so much that you at some point, you didn't need to even remember the URLs you <laughs> wanted to visit, but you could just uh, write a topic you remember that this site contained and, and then Google would just show it to you. So yeah. it's also like a big shift into how, how to like browse internet. And now Google is basically the window to the internet. But it's What's so interesting really... to see how quick things have changed. So we're talking like 10, 20 years uh, approximately. Uh, now kids today, they have like an iPhone when they are like two, three years old. They have their own uh, Netflix uh, login. They watch YouTube and so on. They have seen so much things that the kid probably shouldn't see. But uh, uh, think about like 20 years from now. Uh, no. When we grew up, computers didn't yeah, but... exist. But also think about what we saw when we were kids. I mean, <laughs> I saw stuff that I shouldn't have seen, you know. But what I also find, find is, is a huge difference compared to back then was that I remember when I was searching something, it I had to wait for the search to like <laughs> propagate. Like, no, no, you like this? Yeah. Not, now you, you get <laughs> Google. It's <laughs> like suggesting like if I search something, it's like you're probably going to search for this. So it's like auto completing my search and it's almost like showing everything right away. Back then yeah. you, had, you were like, oh, shit, I searched for the wrong thing. And then like, oh, <laughs> God damn it. 
But give it 20 <laughs> more years and then we'll have Elon Musk's brain implant and then you don't even have to think about it. You only have to think yeah. about it. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah. But, I but remember of, of and course, all technology will be abused. Like like internet was a good thing. Like it was meant to do uh, sharing between universities and well in most of the cases in cases internet is a good thing. But uh, mm -hmm. we've seen that it can be abused like, like you mentioned with uh, with stalking and things like that. But that's with all technology of course. Uh, so um, even though like uh, machine learning self self driving self-driving cars and Elon Musk's uh, brain implant. The intentions are good, but of course there is always going to be like like uh, uh, companies that want to uh, uh, track or sell ads. Of course, there's always going to be some people that want to use it in a bad intention or let's say the military. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And uh, it just like, like, again, just going back a little bit. And I remember the first time I, I encountered hacking, like when I made this websites and, and uh, doing by being part of this certain kind of community, uh, one of my friends website got hacked and they just basically changed the background image and like deface the website. And I think that was like, that was the initial touch for hacking for myself. And, and at that time, I feel that hacking was more cosmetic. It was more about mm -hmm. pranking and stuff because there was nothing really to do other than that. What like do you think it, about uh, the word hacking? I, I always uh, uh, try to avoid oh, no. the word hacking. I, I, <laughs> I prefer being called security researcher instead because, <laughs> because you know, Hollywood and all this, like hack, hack, hackers are always no, no. evil. Yeah. Even let's, most of us are. Let's not, let's not dwell <laughs> on terms. What I want to know is... Uh, is what do you think about security in like 50 to 100 years? Like we have implants, neural implants, maybe we have other implants, what's gonna happen? I was just talking to uh, my boss the other day and I said, I wanna see like a 100 year plan strategy for our team. <laughs> and he was like mind blown, like why would you ask that? But I think mm -hmm. it's interesting to think about like, what's the threat model on a, on a freaking neural, <laughs> neural implant? And, well, you know, stuff like that. be uploaded in the cloud. We will not be physical <laughs> anymore by then. Yeah, yeah, that's an interesting uh, concept because I think security is also it's not stagnant, so it's moving all the time, and we are getting better at stuff that we were really bad at before. So, so it's kind of like things move, and then security comes a tiny bit later, but it, it's still there. So it's trying to address these issues. For example, once the brain implant comes, I'm sure that there will be some kind of security solutions for that as well, then sold or directly like implemented. Maybe not in the first release, uh, but then when once we notice that, okay, people's brains are getting hacked or they're starting to see <laughs> content or like someone's just fuzzing their, <laughs> their, um, uh, the brain implants or something, so, so it's, it's kind of like we, we need to then implement something for that, but it's basically, it's sometimes it's hard to think of what kind of threats there will be, because it's also up to basically the attackers to find an opportunity in something. So for example, when, when doing pen testing or when doing something, then you need to really look at the software in a way that not only how it's designed, but how that design could be interesting to exploit. So for example, if there's a uh let's say a log uh will trans you you could make transactions or something then is there a way that you could fake a transaction or or that you could um input something that is not supposed to be there or, or something like that or if you could bypass some kind of other security mechanism so it's also about looking at the design and finding out what's the design weakness in that yeah. and and yeah that will be interesting once the like we already are quite integrated with certain well with our devices and with the, with the apps to, especially that we use in there but once these devices if they become more intrusive in terms of they are directly implanted into us systematically then it will be interesting also in terms of how those will be patched and and like what happens if they you know they're say yeah, I mean, zero where, day we <laughs> where do you go to patch your brain i mean that's yeah. what it, that's what Miko is saying. Miko Hippena is saying, like, there is no patch for your brain. Well, yeah, 
not right now, but maybe <laughs> yeah. soon. In the future. Know? Yeah, I yeah. saw actually in, in Shark Tank, I think it was this, it was uh, one person made this kind of like an ear device. It was for hands-free and stuff like that. So that had this, like, this was, I think, five years ago, but this had a specific issue of the, how would you patch it? So it would need to go to this person, basically, who would then uh, operate on your ear or ask a doctor to operate on your ear and then fix everything in that. And then if there was something to be patched. So yeah i think there's a lot of question marks in terms of security for those kind of uh intrusive devices but but we'll have to see once they they are yeah. implemented hopefully we'll see like more uh security first and even privacy first companies like you, you know when tesla did the car they, they could have ended with a five star rating the highest rating if possible but they, they still got i think like six stars that's not even possible but mm -hmm. they're like security first and um i i also listened to the Neuralink presentation and uh, uh, at least he said that um that they're going to adopt the same same principle or mindset when they are designing a uh, neural link so security first because in the end it's people's brains it it, <laughs> oh. it it needs to be secure pling pad you have a update for your brain just a sec <laughs> i'll just <laughs> install it quickly <laughs> i'll just patch it yeah. right yeah, and, well, and I think the like a modern way of doing things is definitely like putting security uh, first and, and like thinking about security before implementing stuff and, and before pushing it to production, for example. But then there is just the case that we cannot always foresee everything and, and there may be just a dependency that we're using that has a vulnerability that then causes our, us to be exploited. But... Uh, yeah, it's a interesting, interesting thing to see what will by, happen. By the way, Joachim, uh, I don't want my new link to actually send a notification. I just want it to, to automatically install, kind of like Google Chrome <laughs> does. Because if if we would require user to click yes or no, well, some people will always not click no. Remind click no me because... tomorrow. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, what if you're uh, driving and it starts updating issue. and you black out? It's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, well, that is actually a big issue that that people say remind me tomorrow and then they keep doing that both for windows and and uh, ios and things like that so uh, i really don't want your link to to give that option just update and, and hopefully they have tested it before yeah so it's not causing any conflict with some other things yeah uh, but what if you black out during the up updates <laughs> 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 or maybe there's like a blue screen or something like you know your brain is gonna blue screen or something well yeah anyway it's interesting and yeah. one uh really important thing that you mentioned laura is that we don't know what's gonna happen so i think one of the really important uh, things in this field is that we need to be quick to adapt to new scenarios and things that are about to happen or things that will happen and we just need to be quick at adapting to all kinds of things yeah, definitely. And of course, quick is always relative. So uh, we, we have like uh, machine learning is still a new field. And we're, we're right now seeing machine learning being applied in the security field also. So, but, but, but it's still early, even though machine learning have existed uh, theoretically since like the, the 70s or 80s. Yeah, and it also goes down to, we were talking about this actually with uh, Juha and Antti for our podcast as well, just the aspect of security. So it's easy for us to say, for example, when we find a vulnerability in something that, no, okay, this is how you should fix it and please fix it ASAP. So this is something very critical. But if you're dealing with a big infrastructure, for example, or you have a lot of, uh, let's say, these neural links scattered across the globe, then actually rolling out the updates without it breaking anything. It can be a really hard thing to do. And this is something that I feel is especially true for enterprise environments. So when you have a lot of people connected to one, uh, let's say, domain, like an AD or something, then how do you actually roll out everything so that the business is not hindered? And this is something that I have, I feel that I have learned when doing this, like being security lead and being more on the defensive side as well, so that there is 
um, it's easy to find issues, but sometimes the fix for those issues can be very hard to find. And, and doing a fix can actually break something else. So it can break the UX or the user experience of something, or it can uh, hinder something else. It can make something slower. It can just disrupt the flow of the application, for example, just like that you think that like you thought that this would be easy thing to do and let's just quickly fix this but it's also the fixes that has the foresee unforeseeable effects potentially so it's a very complicated field and i think it's something that we just need continuous discussion between security people and developers and people doing the software and making the software and how do we bring these things together and and make it have like make the magic happen through that yeah and uh pat was also actually we talked about Neuralink before with pat and he said that one of the most important features for him is that we don't need to communicate with words because it's too slow yep. so we can communicate <laughs> with just thinking about stuff and then we can communicate automatically yeah. but I, I can i can also relate to the patching issue because i can imagine like at the Neuralink headquarters you know they're up <laughs> they're, they're sending the patches and then they're like oh shit a guy in the amazon rainforest just <laughs> like crashed <laughs> like what should we do like do we send an engineer or a drone or something to fix him or you know yeah. I, I think there's yeah. a lot of unforeseen uh, problems with these issues <laughs> of course yeah. there are always this Definitely. Have you have you played Metal Gear Solid? No. No. Okay. Yeah. That just remind like in Metal Gear Solid uh, Four, which is chronologically the last one they they have implemented for every soldier, and it has like it's this world where everything is very militarized. So in for every soldier, they have this basically chip in, inserted in them, which helps them to not necessarily verbally communicate with other people, but basically share some kind of emotional emotional state, so that the teammates, for example, could react to their pain and share their pain and so on, and and if they're see, seeing something or they're alerted then the other teammates are also alerted so so that's an interesting topic as well but naturally like these games and sci-fi is always just fiction but they could have also kind of a how, how should i put it like a hint of uh something that could be happening in the future as well but maybe yeah. maybe not the flying cars and and stuff like this but just just something that is just something we are looking forward like not looking forward to, but uh, basically the innovations and, and things we're working on right now that what they could imply in the future. Yeah, and I think uh, I just want to put this out there that if we get Neuralink and we can communicate without words, Pat, I'm fucking blocking you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to know what's going on. <laughs> no, but the, the future will tell. It will be so interesting to see uh, what the future will have to come. Uh, because just look at, uh, you know, the, the book 1984 by George Orwell. It was written in 1949, I think. Uh, so so it, it was only uh, like um, uh, not, not too far in the future. But that is now like uh, the reality or even even worse than when. And he was like thinking, what is the worst thing that I can think about? And now they used it as a handbook more or less. And uh, <laughs> it's 10 times worse than he could ever expect. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So So... Please don't write the book, Laura. On how it's <laughs> yeah, w write a book about like 2070. Let's see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> we have Instagram uh, in our brains. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Oh, shit. Okay. Uh, I think we're a bit over time because we had too much fun. <laughs> but I, I guess that's any, fine. Any final questions, Joachim? Yes, I have one. Uh, final question. What's your favorite ice cream flavor? Uh, that has to be chocolate. Definitely. Good choice. <laughs> Pat, do you have a final question? No, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It was super awesome having you on the stream. So thank you so much. I really enjoyed thank it. You. Hope thank everyone you. in the chat also enjoyed it. And uh, we'll see you next time. Yeah, thank bye. you for inviting me. Thank you. Bye-bye.